to be a reactionary feminist is to is is really the the answer to the question which I grappled with for a number of years, which is: Is it possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? If you don't believe in progress, I do not believe in progress. Uh, wh what do you mean by that? Uh, I believe no, progress. Progress is not an objective thing. I mean, if the moment the well, that's a fact, but one rarely hears it. So please keep keep so, going in that vein. So so progress. Progress is more of a metaphysical frame for, for understanding the world than it is an objective set of measurable facts. Um, if you well, once once you start pulling it apart, you realize that you know, in order to in order to prove that progress is happening, you have to define your terms. And the moment you define your terms, right. you've you've begged the question, which is to say you've assumed the truth of what you set out to prove. Gesundheit. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so, so prog progress is not, I mean, it's, it, you know, there, there's always some progress, but then there are always trade-offs. Yeah. And, and what's, and what's actually going on there when we, when, when you look at progress in, to, in its totality is that what, what we're, what it actually is, is a, it, it's a secularized version of the Christian story of the Christian version of history. That's, that's really what we're looking at. <laughs> This is Socrates in the studio. We are in Oxford, England, and I am thrilled to have as my guest Mary Harrington. Uh, she is a UK-based writer, contributing editor at Unheard, where she has a weekly column. Uh, she also runs the Reactionary Feminist Substack, which we will be discussing. Her book, Feminism Against Progress, focuses on women's rights in the biotech age. Uh, her work's been published in First Things, American Affairs, New York Post, The Spectator, The New Statesman, The London Times, and The Mail. On Sunday, she graduated from Oxford University in 2002 with a first in English literature. Mary Harrington, welcome. Thank you for having I, uh, me, Eric. I hope I've embarrassed you at least a little bit. That's very important. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to talk about with you, which is a, a compliment. Um, the the uh, the title uh, we we gave to this conversation uh, is a discussion on transhumanism, feminism, and human nature, which gets us a little bit into the subject of AI. Um, but why don't we start with your book, Feminism Against Progress, and what you mean by reactionary feminism? I I, I I'm guessing that most people in our audience aren't familiar with with that idea. The idea of reactionary feminism actually started as a joke. I had a very long-running argument with a friend, all via Twitter DM. Um, where all he, via Twitter this, DM. This was actually before we, well, he's a friend now, but, but at that point it was somebody who appeared in my Twitter direct messages to say, you don't, you, you don't want to be a post-liberal feminist, you want to be a reactionary. And I said, what? Who are you? Um, and then we had this extremely long-running argument that went on for months and months and months, where he said being post-liberal was meaningless, and I said, "No, no, this is this is nonsense." And it was a very long argument. And in the end, I conceded I conceded his point. I was like, "Okay, fine, reactionary makes more sense," um, but I wasn't going to tell him that um, because I just <laughs> so instead I just changed my Twitter bio to say reactionary feminist, where previously it said uh, post-liberal feminist. And that was and that was how reactionary feminist came to be coined. And then. Um, Matt Schmitz wrote to me from First Things to say, this is an arresting phrase. Would you like to write an article with us and explain what it means? At which point I had to figure out what it meant. So I said, That is actually yeah. very funny. So I, I had to, it, it, it was reverse engineered. But I mean, my, one, of my, one of my maxims is that you should meme first and ask questions later. Um, because it's usually the case yeah. that if something sounds good in meme form, it will unpack into about ten thousand words of normal person language, well, yes. and it will make and it will make sense in that as well. But it just takes many more words to get there. But that, I mean, that's the nature of truth, isn't it? I it's very early in the conversation to be there already, but yeah, I'll roll with that. Well, I mean, truth, beauty. There, there's something. Um, I don't know. I would I would argue. I mean, if uh, we're not. <laughs> yeah, we, it is early in the conversation, but you know, when you're talking about human nature, I would argue that we have an innate affinity uh, for the good, the beautiful, and the true. And so somehow, you know, in in a good meme, you you recognize something, and you're not you don't need yeah. to be sure yet what it is. Yeah, and, I think and you, that's you true. can unpack it as you yeah. do, as you did, if you've done. Yep. Uh, in retrospect, I think that's right. I think that's right. You look at something and you think yes, and you don't know why yet. 
um, and it's it's usually because you 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 sense you sense the way it makes sense in a in a non-linear way in a non-rational way right. in a on the on, on on the axis of pattern recognition or something something anyway and so so that was that was how that happened and then I tried to write the article for first things and that was really difficult because then I had to figure out what I meant and it's much more difficult to write something out at length in normal person than it is to do it in meme form um, but I got there in the end and actually that was that article which is called reactionary feminism and it's still up at first things um, turned in probably probably became the backbone of the book when when did that article appear it roughly was, uh, 2021 maybe yeah somewhere 2020 or 2021 thereabouts it was some time ago um, and then over the course in the course of that you know I'd, I'd been talking to publishers about maybe writing something and I wanted to write something about feminism after freedom um, and when I started Fe excuse me feminism after, after freedom, freedom I, I had what this, do you mean I had this these I had this idea not knocking around in my mind that actually maybe we were all liberated enough that we're all liberated enough. Yeah, we're, we're all about as liberated as we need to be. And maybe, getting any maybe, more. <laughs> maybe you had that idea because it's true. <laughs> uh, and because raging against the lack of freedom when one is free is foolish. Yeah, I mean, that would be, that I would agree, that, that, that would be my sense as well. I mean, you know, to be clear, this isn't the case everywhere in the world, but in, in, the, in the developed world, in the post-industrial, high-tech, developed white Western world, especially among the wealthy, I think it's almost certainly true. And that in fact, any more liberated and we, we sort of, well, I don't know, we're just going to become a puddle or, or, or something we don't really want to be. So, well, um, <laughs> so why so, do you think it is so chic to play the oppressed uh, victim when as most of us know, we're most of us in this part of the world. We are genuinely free. I don't know. Honestly, Eric, I think that's mostly just office politics in the female key. Office politics in the female key. So I was I was explaining this to somebody. This is this is slightly off the topic of the book um, because I didn't I didn't really get into this so much in the book. But if you, I, I, I read a very interesting some very interesting work by the social scientist Joyce Benenson on the difference between male and female typical aggression. Because I think it's it's not true that women are less aggressive than men. I mean, it's certainly true that women are less physically violent than men, and that's just uh, measurably the case pretty well, much. Let's keep it that way. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I, can't, I can't speak to the propensity of men to do what they do, but you know, it's, the, the, there is a measurable difference, and it's, and it's cross-culturally apparent between the average levels of physical violence in men and in women. And, and you, can, you can make a fairly plausible case that this is evolutionarily adaptive and you know, has its roots in mate competition or yada, yada, yada. Anyway, that's, it, 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 that's a thing. Um, but it, but this, this isn't to say that women are never aggressive. They just do it in a different way. Um, and again, evolutionary psychologists and, you know, and people who study, people who are cleverer than me and study these things argue that um, because it's generally the case that women are more, it, it, it's more beneficial for women to, to, to cooperate with one another in groups, you know, to protect, to protect the young, um, to, to safeguard the, the, the totality of the group. Um, there's a, there, are, there are incentives against um, fighting within the group. For example, so, but, but this is this is not to say that people never fall out or people never disagree. So what tends to happen and what has been, what has evolved is is a much greater tendency to to fight covertly. So, female according to Benson, female typical forms of aggression might be character assassination, mobilizing a whisper campaign, um, excluding, <laughs> uh, ostracizing. This is all people. very sexist. I'm offended it's, on behalf of all the women is, in my life. This is this is not this is not me making generalized statements out of nowhere. This, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. This is this is this is the work of Joyce Benson on on female typical aggression. Uh, so character assassination, ostracism, whis whisper campaigns. You know, mobilizing. Nagging. Nagging. I, I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting involved in your relationship yeah. here, Eric. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll be in trouble with. Oh, with, if I have Mrs. a relationship Pataxis. left after so, <laughs> talking about nagging. No. Uh, so, but, yeah. but, but uh, just to just to just to close the loop on what you were asking me about office yeah. politics and the female key. So it stands to reason that the more women there are in public life, the more we will see female typical forms of aggression in public life. 
this seems logical, right? Yeah. You know, where there, are, where there are more women, we're going to see more female typical aggression. Therefore, it makes sense that we will begin to see more character assassination, whisper campaigns, social ostracism in the workplace, for example. And you will tend to, and, and that really, and when you, when you think about what happens when somebody gets very loudly and publicly cancelled, for example, in journalism, what you will notice when you look at the cases involved that there are plenty of instances where somebody can do very much the same thing and get away with it. And then you look at them and you think, well, what's the difference between this case and that case? And I think, and I'm willing to bet, although I can't prove it, that generally speaking, the difference is office politics. You know, that this, this guy was somebody they wanted to get rid of. That guy was somebody they wanted to keep around. And that so, this, was, this was much, this was about, this is fundamentally about office politics. Okay, what you're so, often, but the, I mean, so the larger point I think you're making is that there's nothing, um, we're not dealing with objective morality. We're dealing with, uh, you know, it's like when Stalin said, find me the man and I'll, and I'll, I'll or, show me the man and I'll, and I'll find you the crime. Right. In other words, it's utterly subjective and right. uh so so victim victimhood is just a useful weapon and if it wasn't victimhood it would be something else now i have no recollection of how we got onto the subject Mary. <laughs> uh i think i got enough sleep but uh you, what 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 got us into this you were talking about uh i i can't remember what it was that prompted you to talk um about this idea how did I how did I end up becoming the reactionary feminist? Um, sort of by accident, as it turned out. But then, I mean, it's it, it's a meme. It's it, it's a thing now. It's a thing now. I've I've seen I've seen reactionary feminists in the wild. Um, I've seen I've seen it on other people's Twitter bios. This is just uh, it's it's beyond my control now. Yeah. It's, it belongs to the world. I'm I'm you know fly free. Yeah. It yeah. Can, it's well because what you've done really is you've you've given uh, words or a term. To something that people have observed, and that's. Uh, but but let me explain what I what I've come to what I've come to think by this very long roundabout route to to believe what I mean by it. Um, the to be a reactionary feminist is to is is really the the answer to the question which I grappled with for a number of years, which is: Is it possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress? If you don't believe in progress, I do not believe in progress. Uh, wh what do you mean by that? Uh, I believe no, progress. Progress is not an objective thing. I mean, if the moment the well, that's a fact, but one rarely hears it. So please keep keep so, going in that vein. So, so progress progress is more of a metaphysical frame for for understanding the world than it is an objective set of measurable facts. Um, if you well, once once you start pulling it apart, you realize that you know, in order to in order to prove that progress is happening, you have to define your terms. And the moment you define your terms, right. you've you've begged the question. Which is to say, you've assumed the truth of what you set out to prove. Gesundheit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. So 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 prog progress is not. I mean, it's it, you know there, there's always some progress, but then there are always trade offs. Yeah. And and what's and what's actually going on there when we when when you look at progress in in its totality, is that what what we're what it actually is is a it, it's a secularized version of the Christian story of the Christian version of history. That's that's really what we're looking at. You know, which, which fine, you know, we've secularized a whole bunch of other aspects of Christianity yeah. as well. You know, you've just spent some wonderful time with Tom Holland. Yeah. I imagine you touched on some of those, yeah. some of those, uh, he, he's, he's done hugely, hugely important and persuasive work on all the millions, all the countless ways that Christianity has just bled into the fabric of everything. Yeah. Um, and, and progress is, is, is a case in point. You know, I, I'm just going to point at Tom Holland, who you were, who you were yeah. with just yeah. now and say what he said. <laughs> but, so, so I don't believe I don't believe in progress. Well, you say that. I don't know that you you mean it exactly. I want I want to probe it a little bit. Uh, you you don't you don't believe in progress the way maybe progressives believe in progress. In other words, th th this idea that we are. I mean, underlying that idea to to my mind is is this idea of evolution that we're all evolving toward something better and you think well what why what is it about human nature or about reality that would make you say that but there it, it is an underlying assumption that, that uh i think i think is mistaken so i'm with you on that i don't believe in that kind of progress but you okay you, so so things change that much is obvious you know we don't live in the same world as yeah. the ancient romans did. right but you know is that world better or worse in an in an absolute sense taking everything into consideration yeah. i don't know 
I mean, that's just not really, a, it's not really, you know, you can, you can make well, that assertion. I would say if you go back to the, to the Roman Empire, you could say, yeah, things are better. But if you go back to the Victorian or the Edwardian, you could say, I don't know. In other words, I'd be happier saying, I don't know, <laughs> if we want to look at the Edwardian era than at the, uh, just, just to... I mean, you know, we could be here all, you know, de debating whether or not the, the Roman Empire was better or worse than what we have now. You know, they, there were some pretty, pretty sketchy things about the Roman Empire. Oh, but... you think? <laughs> yeah. We could be, Slavery right, and crucifixion. Afternoon. Right. What, yeah. what other things can we ding them with? Let's see. Um, infanticide? Uh, yeah. 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 That's, that was pretty gross. Well, so, yeah. okay, so... As, you know, it, they had I, some pretty hideous ways of putting people to death. Right. So um, if you're going to, <laughs> if you're going to uh, bring that up, why wouldn't you believe in progress? Are you saying, I think I know what you're saying, but clarify for me, why, why wouldn't you believe in progress? Is it because we can easily go backwards as well as forwards? Well, I mean, I would argue, you know, we have some pretty horrendous things now. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> you look at the totality of factory farming, which is an atrocity. You know, you look at the atom bomb, that's an atrocity. You know, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Nagasaki, the Romans never, never marmalized entire cities on that scale. Is that I a mean, verb, are, Mary? But yes, well, well <laughs> it's, it's slightly a Harrington, well, I mean, it's a, it's a family, it's a family word, but, okay. but um, I mean, you, you understand, you understand what I'm saying. You know, I, I don't know how these, and I don't know how these things cash out. And the point really is that the only the only way you could make some kind of assessment in the grand in the grand scale would be from from the perspective of of, of some sort of omniscient divine being, which I think gives us a clue to what we're actually talking about when we're talking about progress, which is which is a kind of covert. It's a disguised form of metaphysics. Well, um, there's yeah, and it's then a, usually it, not at all not it's all a that kind disguised. Of yeah. But you're you know you're you're absolutely right. It's but, a secularized eschatology. <laughs> absolutely. And you can say Gesundheit again. A absolutely. No, no, no. But that's no, that's, a, that's a, a term that I wouldn't sneeze at. Hmm. Um, <laughs> well, so secularized eschatology, uh, the, the idea of, uh, I don't know who said it, but it was popularized by William F. Buckley to imminentize yes. the eschaton. Yes. Don't imminentize the eschaton. Right. In other words, that's to me, that's the French Revolution. That's yes. the current yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. crop of progressives that yep. we, we, we want heaven on earth and if we have to kill a few people to get there that's not that's and this not problem. actually brings me very nicely to the thesis of my book um, because the when once you start looking at what happens from the french revolution onwards really with with people trying to imminentize the eschaton is that if you're trying to realize heaven on earth the only the only means you have at your disposal to do so are technological ones because if you're going to talk if you're if you're going to set about um, trying to trying to improve the world and re-engineer the world you know in line with your utopian vision you know, all you have, all you have to hand is what you have to hand. You know, you can't just punt it all into the next life. You've got, you've got to fix it here, and that means that means using whatever means you have at your disposal, and that means probably engineering. Yeah, but that's um, and and that's really what's what what began to happen with the with the arrival of modernity, um, which which starts in England a little bit earlier than it starts in France, but it really it really gets into gear with the with the French Revolution. Um, and it gets into gear, you know, across Europe, and then and then spreading into the United States with with industrialization. And my and like the start, my starting thesis for feminism against progress is that you can read the entire history of the women's movement as an aggregate response to the disruptions and the changes and the transformations this brought about in family life. Now, b b before you get into that, because I want you to get into that, but. Uh, why feminism at all? In other words, why are you a feminist? And what do you mean by feminist? Well, I just mean, uh, I mean, it, it remains true, you know, even if I don't believe in progress. And I, I really grappled with this, you know, I grappled with it for a long time because um, it, 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 was not, it's, it wasn't clear to me at all for a long time whether it's possible to be a feminist if you don't believe in progress because the history of you know, progressivism as such is, is so bound up with with feminism yeah. as an ideology and it's and it then there's the stories i mean you, and anytime i said oh i don't believe in progress somebody would say to me ah oh, would you want to go back to being the property of your husband and having no vote and not being allowed to own property <laughs> you know stick that in your pipe and smoke yeah, it yeah, yeah. and i'd say well okay but you know there have been some trade-offs as well and can we can we maybe but being honest about that is very brave um, uh and uh i'm sure has earned you a few enemies um because, however i've yeah. come to think over time, that why why shouldn't why shouldn't I have the word? Why should why should the progressives have it? Yeah. Why, why 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 can't I take my ball and go home? You know, but ultimately, even if you don't believe in progress, it yeah. ought to be obvious that the interests of men and the interests of women broadly, you know, benefit from supporting one another, but they don't always add up. And sometimes, and it's often the case that the interests of women are, are sidelined. 
you know not not least not least because it, it's it's not un, it's it's not a, it's not uncommonly the case that women are not there to stick up for themselves because somebody's got to look after the kids i mean to, actually to give you to give you an example to illustrate i found I've, I've got a fantastic anthology of radical feminist writings from the 70s and 80s and in one of those pieces there's this incredibly telling anecdote about a vote that was taken in a feminist in a feminist com commune feminist community center of some kind over whether or not they should open a crash and they voted, and, and the women who were there voted against it. And, and do, you know, do you know how that vote passed? It was because the women who would have voted for the creche were at home looking after the kids. <laughs> That's telling. It's telling. This, is, this even happened in the midst of a feminist community. So yeah. of course it happens at the bigger scale as well. You know, so who's, who's going to speak up for the mums if they're busy? So it's a yeah. problem. Yeah. Even it, and and that's, that, that's not just going to be a problem in, amongst feminists. That's going to be a problem for everybody. So somebody's got to. And I mean, why shouldn't we call that feminism? Isn't that what it is? I don't know. So, I'm, so, so I've just decided I'm going to say that's, that's feminism too. Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to keep my ball. I'm not giving that one away. Yeah. Well, that, uh, I mean, so I, I do want to ask you, I should, I'll ask you now, uh, how did you get to, to be who you are now? In other words, were, were you always thinking along these lines? Was there something in your life that uh, suddenly made you take some of the positions you've, you've taken? There's a, there's a very long answer to that and a slightly shorter one. So I'll stick to the slightly shorter one. Um, the, the story I told in the book about how I began thinking about women's issues was, was a dilemma which I began to realize I faced as the only daughter, with, with uh, the, the, only, the only girl of three siblings in my family. So I had a younger brother and an older brother. Um, my parents had fairly, I'd say fairly quote unquote traditional sex roles in the 20th century sense. My mum was a stay at home mum, my dad went out to work. And I remember getting the, reaching a point, I guess I, I must have been maybe 13 or thereabouts, where I realized- I thought I, you said 10. No, no, who? I thought I read this. I, th I, I it's it's ringing a bell with me. It doesn't matter. How, how, I mean, some, somewhere, 13, somewhere, yeah. somewhere in uh, somewhere yeah. around puberty. Yeah. Um, I began to notice that my dad would get up at the end of dinner and he'd leave the table and he'd leave his dishes on the table and my mum would have made the dinner and she'd have set the table and she'd have got you know got everything ready. We'd all sit down and eat. My dad would get up and leave and leave leave the leave the dishes for for somebody question mark to clear up. And then I began to notice that my brothers would 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 imitate him. They would get up and leave as well and leave their dishes on the table. And I was thinking, okay, so now, now, now I have a choice. So I've always been given to understand by my dad, as well as by my mum, that I have equal standing with my brothers in the family. There's no sense in which I'm some kind of second class citizen in the context of our family. However, I'm now faced with a situation where I either, either I assert my equal right to leave the dishes for question mark to clean up, um, and walk away from the table yeah. with my brothers and yeah. my father, or I express some kind of solidarity with my mother as the only other female in the household, and thereby concede my second-class status as somebody who has to serve everybody else. This seemed to me an unfair and impossible dilemma. That started, <laughs> I, what I guess must be a third, you know, more than three decades of thinking about, thinking about the women's movement, and thinking about women, and thinking about women and men. And it's gone through it's gone through many iterations and many cycles and many different forms to, to reach the point I'm at with it now. But that was what started it off. Shortly after that, I discovered Simone de Beauvoir, who melted my brain. Um, you know, and, the, <laughs> and, and well, yeah. you've, you've come a long way from Simone de Beauvoir. You could say that, yes. And I and I did. <laughs> where 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 are you now? What do you make of Simone de Beauvoir today? <sighs> I, I kind of understand where she was coming from, but I also think she paved the way for a much more radical, um, a, a much more radical mutiny against femaleness than even she would have thought was wise. Against femaleness. Yes, she, she, she. Her, her whole stance was that. It was, in a sense, you know, a, a, a kind of critical handicap to attaining personhood to be female. Yeah, she stop. she seems to have hated. She she seemed to she being a woman. Yeah, she seemed to have hated being a woman. She seemed to it was somehow a gross insult against her her striving for existential personhood 
to, to be female and to be constructed in this way and to have the, the handicap of a female reproductive system. And that this, it, 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 it was, it's as though, it's as though to be sexed was an affront to her dignity and her personhood. And, and she never did really got around this. I don't think so. And I mean, she had, she had hugely complicated relationships and I don't think she had children. With um, sort. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, go figure. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, so, so I've, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm on board with the with the Simone de Beauvoir project. No. Um, but it was, it, it was just, it was, in, it was eye opening to me, age thirteen or whatever I was, to discover that somebody had given quite that much angry and resentful thought to some of the same problems as I was grappling with at sort of micro scale, in in my own life. And I guess that started a lifelong, a lifelong interest, and inquiry. But that's been the problem, it seems to me, with feminism, is the idea that uh, there's so much of that in it. The, the idea that uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't seem to have, maybe until you, uh, understood where it, where it wanted to go. Well, I don't think, I, don't, I, I would dispute that, just because it's a much, a much longer and more fractious history than you, would, than you would think if you only ever read the magazine Feminism. Uh, that yeah. gets sort of popular, yeah. gets propagated in a popular sense. And it's also not helped by the fact that sex, since the second wave, there's been a very methodical effort by, uh, by some feminists themselves to memory hole earlier iterations of feminism. Like Mary Wolf, Wollstonecraft. I mean, Mary Wolf, yeah, the legacy of Mary Wollstonecraft is very, is very contested. Um, but there's a, there's, there's a sort of collective amnesia. It's, it's beginning to, sh it's beginning to come apart. But the, for a long time, there's been this real collective amnesia about the 19th century. Yeah. And the, that, that entire history, which is very much more complex and very much more, in, very much more ambivalent, very much more interesting to me than, than, than just the story of the vote. You know, there, were, there, yeah. there was a women's, incredibly well-networked and, and powerful and mobilized women's movement long before the suffragettes began. Yeah. And, there were, and, and, and they had, and, and this women's movement actually had very mixed feelings about the suffragettes. Um, you know, even the suffragettes had mixed feelings about the suffragettes. It was, it's full, it's a hugely complicated, yeah. very fractious yeah. history. And, the, the, and the, the, the second wave story of, you know, liberation from, from sexist stereotypes really doesn't do it justice. That's, that's a story which is, it, it, right, the, the, the winners write the history books. That, and, and that's what, what we're happened. talking about, right? Isn't <laughs> and, that, that's exactly what you're saying, to yes. memory hole. In other words, it's to, to insist on a certain narrative. Yes, and yes. To, and, and I'll explain, to, I'll explain yeah. why and what happened there, or at least my, my, my thesis for what happened yeah. there, which is that you know, really out of, out of industrialization um, came a, 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 a very necessary and justified need for women to respond to the way in, the industrial revolution had transformed family life, yes. and particularly by draining work out of the home, um, which obviously created new problems for women who had previously you know, in various sort of agrarian and artisan settings worked in conjunction with minding little children. I mean, clearly you can breastfeed whilst simultaneously weaving textiles for the family at home. You know, and that had been the case for, you know, tens of thousands of years in one form or another, as some kind of a life along those lines. Mm. But then with the Industrial Revolution, textile making leaves the home. Yeah, male employment, male labor leaves the home. Um, and then women are left, and particularly in working in poorer settings, women are suddenly in a position where they need to, they need to, they need to go out somewhere else to work. Um, you know, I mean, if, and you, if you've got a breastfed baby and you're supposed to be working in a factory, I mean, what do you do? You know, it creates a whole new set of a whole new set of dilemmas that women just simply hadn't had to deal with at scale before. And wherever, and 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 the way I've, the way I've understood it, this, there were two characteristic responses to this. Um, really, de mostly depending on social class, those women who could afford to stayed home in this very, in actually what was a what was a much reduced role, where they were no longer economically active as members of a productive household, but they were, as it were, the chief consumer in a private household, and 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 a lot of those women formed the backbone of what became nineteenth century industrial era civil society. You know, they founded church groups and social reform groups and ladies ladies luncheon groups and and they and and all the entire thick social fabric of of 19th century britain and america was run by by middle class stay at home ladies they were not the, they were not the isolated housewives of the sort of betty friedan story they were they were something very much more potent and very much more public facing yeah um, so that was and 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 they wrote and they wrote vigorously and prolifically, and they published their own magazines. And, and a lot of these magazines were very much dedicated to the, this, what they called the, the women, woman's sphere, um, which is now 
it's now dismissed by a lot of feminist historiography as sort of fifth columnists for the patriarchy. But I read most yeah. of, I read that straightforwardly as a kind of feminism. And what they're doing is they're making a case for the importance of women's work. Yeah. Even even though the even though women's sphere has shrunk and is no longer an economically active sphere, they're making they're saying, well, this stuff still matters. Kids still matter. The education of children still matters. Having a nice home still matters. All of this stuff is really important, and so we're gonna we're gonna sing the praises. So they didn't denigrate it, right? Right. So this is this is one half of the response. But then there were also women who said, well, no, actually, all of this is fine, but it's only fine as long as your husband is a good guy. And what it's, happens if he's not? It's only fine. It only works if your husband doesn't drink the money away, and it's only fine if he doesn't beat you, and it's only fine if he. You know, is it isn't isn't a terrible person in all the other ways because he has effectively, um, he has he's the they were utterly at the mercy of their husbands. You know, when you can't divorce, you can't own property in your own right. You can't really work, um, and if you separate, your 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 husband has absolute control over what happens to the children. You're in a pretty tough. You know, if you're mm -hmm. if, if if he's not a good guy, you're in a tough spot. And there are lots of pretty heartbreaking stories from women who found themselves at the sharp end of that. And so then, of course, you, then you start to see movements for for, for legal reform, for you know, movements challenging challenging nineteenth century marriage laws, um, coverture coverture marriage, um, and demanding and, and calling for women's legal and political personhood in their own right, which which effectively amounts to an egalitarian call for women's right to enter the market on the same terms as mm -hmm. men. So, so these are really the two poles of 19th century feminism, um, which I think of as feminism proper. You know, on the one hand, you've got this sort of domestic feminism of care and feminism yeah. of motherhood, which leans into women's difference from men and says, no, actually, yeah, we need to make the case for mater maternality. And maternal feminism was hugely huge in the 19th century in a way that it just isn't now. I'll get to why in a moment. And then on the other side, you've got the feminism of freedom. Which says no. Actually, we need to. We, we can't be bound to one another in this way because women are going to be chronically on the back foot. And look at these. Look at these horror stories. And what we actually need is the right to work and the right to vote and the right to own property and the right to be people in in, in the in this in, in this new market society that we're all now living in. And they were kind of both right, but some often what they wanted was mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And so there's this there's this fascinatingly rich back and forth. Um, between between the, the the maternal feminists and the freedom feminists that goes on all the way up to the nine, pretty much the 1960s, you know, in very sort of locally and historically specific yeah. ways. But then what happened in the 1960s was a new technology, which which ended the, the battle. Pi the pill. Yeah, definitively in the favour of the freedom feminists. Right, because you don't hear which, anything about the maternal sphere, the female after sphere. That. It's it's been memory hold, as you put it. It has. And I'll tell you what memory hold it really. Um, it, it was the 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 ratchet from normalisation of um, was it the, the the ratchet from the sexual revolution which came with the pill, and from there to legal to legal abortion. Um, because I mean, where, wherever you stand on legal abortion, and I'm not a I'm not an absolutist. I'm very um, it's, it's a it, it's one of those things where there really are no good solutions sometimes, and it's a very grave and serious thing and very emotive one. Um, but wherever you stand on it, it's very it's difficult to dispute that I mean you can't really make a stronger statement in favor of freedom over dependency and over care than to say my personal freedom is so important that I can I can uphold it even at the expense of a life which depends on on my actual body. Um, and if it comes down to a question of hospitality to this potential person or my personal free or my individual freedom, my freedom wins and I have that right. And once once that begins to be understood as a foundational precondition for women's existence as, as people in their own right, which is really which is which, which became it, it, it became it, it has come to seem self evident since the 1960s that women's personhood as such is inseparable from our right to end a pregnancy. Um, it, has, uh, it has come to seem that way. It has come to seem that way. It didn't always seem that way. Yeah. 19, there are a great many 19th century feminists who would have seen abortion as in, uh, indistinguishable from infanticide, you know, as, as infanticide, in fact, just at a different developmental point. Well, and, and as many women who would describe themselves as feminists do today, but they're no longer really, uh, <laughs> they, they, they really don't have control of the narrative anymore. They seem they to be in the not. minority. They do not. Yeah. So, so this, was, this was really the point where the, where the feminism of freedom uh, defeated the feminism of care. And, and I, I, got to the, I got to thinking about this, Eric, because I, 
<laughs> having been having been hopeless at so many different careers over the course of my adult life, after I left I left university with a first and proceeded to be useless at everything I tried um, for the best part of two decades. And I ended up I ended up as a stay at home mum in small town England, pushing my baby around the streets, um, How wondering. Pathetic. I know, but no, it was great. So it was great. sad. I mean, it was. It, it gave. It left me a lot of time to think about men and women and sex roles, and to question some of the some of the things I'd always internalised about, you know, what what that meant. Um, but anyway, long story short, there I was thinking, why is it? Why is it that being a mum feels so invisible? Why is it that feminists don't seem to have anything to say about being a mum? This feels important. This feels quite common amongst women, right? So why 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 are we not talking about this? Well, you know, there are, and, and the streets are empty, and the, almost all of the women are at work, and and now I'm sort of scratching. And you know, Mark, my husband is like, "Do you want to go back to work?" And I'm like, "I don't, know, not really. No, I can't think of anything. I was rubbish at all my careers. I don't want to do any of them anymore. I don't want to. I, there's nothing I want to do that more than look after my child. And this is you know, pondering all of this, and you know, lonely, wandering around the streets with <laughs> my child, thinking, well, you know, why why is nobody talking about mothers? Um, why? Uh, why are they? Why are we so invisible? And and I came and and that was really what sent me down this this whole rabbit hole to begin with, and and it's fairly and recently. This this was this would have been two thousand sixteen two thousand seventeen. I was I was thinking about all of this stuff. My child was small enough to be in a buggy at that point. Your child um, what? She she would have been small enough to be in a buggy. To be in a point. buggy. Yeah. Yeah. To have been to be pushed around. Yeah. You know, yeah. For naps, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so and 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 this and this was how I came to. I, I came came to be thinking at all about where where the missing maternal feminists were, because it once I mean once I once I find something like that nags at me and I'll end up going down the rabbit hole and I just won't be able to leave yeah. it and I'll go reading and I'll go rummaging and I'll find things and I realised that actually there are lots of maternal feminists they come back again and again and again you know there's a whole tranche of literature from the 1960s a whole tranche of literature from earlier as well I'm thinking why does nobody talk about these why why are we why have they been forgotten you know what's going on here? Are, are, I, you, I, are you the most prominent voice today in bringing this idea back? I'll probably get memory hold in turn. You know, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, given given what's happened to the last lot, you know, people will be like, oh yeah, that Mary, oh yeah, yeah, whatever. She she wrote some stuff, but who cares? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> look, I think the the reason you're you've become popular is because there is a hunger for people thinking about this the way you are. Well, well, let, let, let's hope so. Um, Let's hope so because it brings us. I mean, the it brings us to the question or to the to the issue of uh, of human nature. Uh, you're you're daring to think somewhat courageously about what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? You know, things that uh, sometimes people say. Well, we're we're not talking about. It. We don't talk about that. But you're you're daring to think about it, trying to be honest about right. it. Right, and actually bringing bringing these these themes that we've been exploring together, you know, they they do they do coalesce on the question of human nature. So I've I've talked about this this real this inflection point in the 1960s where where freedom feminism won out over maternal feminism, mm. if you like, and really how, and how the how that how that came came to be the case via the the embrace of a, a contracept, the contraceptive paradigm, if you like, the sort of biotechnology the biotechnologization of women's bodies as a precondition for our our existence as people. Mm -hmm. um, which I I mean I've, I've in the book I've called it the the beginning of the cyborg era in the sense that by embracing personhood on these terms, women are effectively exceed, acceding to a paradigm that, that, con, that constructs us as cyborgs. You know, we, I, I don't exist except in as much as I'm willing to technologize myself to take my reproductive role out of the picture. To talk uh, about the Ponzi scheme, uh, <laughs> the, because this leads us to that, I think. Just to finish, just to finish the thought about human nature, the cyborg, the the, the cyborg era, and the the end of the end the end of maternal feminism. I'll I'll get to the Ponzi scheme um, because that that really that, that that's what that's what being a mother looks like once you're in the cyborg era. Right. Um, but the the question of human nature is is difficult in this context because if if we're if you set about immanentizing the eschaton, which was really where we started, you know, trying to realize heaven on earth, uh, the the point where we arrive at the cyborg era is the point where we start trying to technologize away our own nature. And that begins with women 
the entry, our entry collectively into the cyborg era begins with the technologization of women's bodies, which is really about trying to realize heaven on earth by making everybody radically equal, by, by abolishing those inconvenient ways that women are different and seem disadvantaged in terms of market society by virtue of our different reproductive role. So really, it's it's about you know we're, we're using these these biomedical technologies to to try and realize heaven on heaven in our own bodies, to in to realize heaven on earth. Um, How so, strange that Mary Shelley, uh, in her book Frankenstein, seems prophetically to really be talking was. about these yep. things over two hundred years ago. She saw it. She saw it. Isn't that amazing? And of course, she was she, she was a relative of Mary Wollstonecraft. Yes, so, yeah. it's it's amazing yep. to me. Anyway, it's so. An, yeah, so the, there are there are some extraordinarily prophetic uh, women where it comes to seeing seeing where the technological paradigm would would lead us eventually. But yeah, so so the so so here we are now. You know, we're fifty years into the cyborg paradigm. We're, we're into the cyborg uh, age. You know, the industrialization of human bodies has proceeded a great deal further down, along that line. Mm -hmm. You know, where we started out with, you know, rolling out radical egalitarianism in women's bodies. I mean, it follows logically from that that we should be able to use biotech to, 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 to level the playing field in any other way uh, that, that we, or, or to, 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 to flatten out um, injustices, embodied injustices, in any other way that we, that we see, you know, mm -hmm. we can cut bits off ourselves or we can take a pill that fixes this or that. Or, or I don't know. We, we, in, in theory, the potential the potential that opens up for re-engineering ourselves is limitless. In theory. You know, in theory. In practice, that's not how it works because it just isn't. And this is this this is the really the just just to finish that thought off about human nature. I think we have a powerful illustration in the contraceptive pill of how that is not in fact true. And 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 this, this is really one of the reasons, one of the causes I have for hope, Eric. Um, is that 50, we've had 50 years of the contraceptive pill now, and the utopians who, who greeted this tech, they hailed this technology and embraced this technology when it first came out, genuinely believed that it would it would right all of the asymmetries between men and women in terms of how we and how how men how the sexes were able to enjoy sexual freedom, um, and that it, it it would it would enable women to to enjoy casual sexual contact in on the same terms as men, and that they all. Uh, and that they would enjoy it, which, as it turned out, was something of an assumption. And what, but and in practice, in practice, that's not how it's turned out. You know, the sexes are not, uh, the, the sexes haven't just become indistinguishable in terms of how they approach intimacy. That's that, that's not how it's worked out at all. If anything, the uh, my my great friend Louise Perry recently wrote a book, very very convincing book, called "The Case Against the Sexual Revolution." Where she argues that actually the sexual revolution has mostly ended up empowering a small a small subset of highly sociosexual, um, borderline sociopathic men who who get as much sex as they like, and everybody else is everybody else is suffering in a bunch of different ways. And women women really haven't done very well out of it because they the the normative female craving for intimate relationship and long term long term affectionate intimacy, which has not gone away. Over the last fifty years, no matter what the utopians imagine, yeah. um, is now is now much more difficult to fulfil because sexual access is no longer a, a, no longer something that you can conjure with to to pursue that kind of that kind of long term committed partnership. Um, so on average, it's ended up it's ended up it, it has not it has not been the great boon to women that. That, that we thought it would be, and in the in in in, how, in the the way these things have played out, we can see the contours of our sex differences just as clearly as we could before the sexual revolution. We can see we can see the the normative behaviours of men, and we can see the normative behaviours of women, and really they they haven't changed a whole lot over those fifty years. And you might think, well, that's a dispiriting, that, that's a depressing conclusion, Mary. But <laughs> but I look at it and, I, and it gives me hope because it makes me think, well, okay, so now, now they're threatening artificial wounds or they're threatening all sorts of other deranged technologies, and people are saying, "Oh, what if this turns us into something which isn't human?" And I think, well, no. That's, I mean, if if it works, if it shakes down the way it shook down with the pill, you know, we'll probably end up creating some atrocities as a byproduct. And I'm not cool with that, to be clear. <laughs> but the end the end point will be that we will we will be able to see much more clearly once again well, the contours of our actual nature. And we'll do our we'll do our level best to technologize it away, and we'll just end up being able to see once again why we are the way we are. So you're, I want to get to the Ponzi scheme, but uh, and you you almost got there, but you are talking. I am holding that thought. Trust me. Okay, but you are, but you are talking about human nature as though 
there is an objective reality. And uh, there are many people who simply don't believe that, which gets us to transhumanism. I mean, there are really people um, who are convinced that there is no limit to what we might become. And it seems like what you're saying is they try again and again, whether it's with the pill or with the idea of an artificial womb, that they keep trying and it keeps coming back. Uh, there's, there's, you know, it's like betting against the house. You always lose, but they, they keep trying. That's my expectation. They will keep trying and it's going to suck, And they're, but they're betting against the house. Yeah. Um, I can't prove it. You know, <laughs> the only, the only, we're going to find out the hard way. You know, we can jump up and down and say, well, don't do this because you're just going to create monsters and then we'll just end up with human nature again. Um, but the, nobody's going to listen to me. You know, I'm just some, some woman who lives in a cupboard full of books. Nobody, nobody's going to pay any attention to me. So, they, so we're going to find out the hard way. But, you know, it'll be 50 years into trying to, trying to become superhumans or, you know, trying to optimize humans for 250 IQ or realize that actually that was catastrophic in some other way and that we just hadn't banked on because we weren't looking at the, the integrity and the totality of the human organism. Well, so what do you think it is about the nature of reality or the nature of, of human nature, speaking objectively, um, that works against these things? Why, why, um, why is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein prophetic. What, what, what is it about we humans? It's funny. I was for, for the longest time. I thought maybe maybe my ten year project should be to try and figure out a way to talk about human nature without having to go via the church fathers. Because I mean, it seems like the, the most direct route is to go via go go via the, the the church fathers. But but you can't really do that because people you can't really do that now because people just won't listen. Um, if you you, know, you start talk, you start throwing Thomas Aquinas at people and right. they'll, they'll, they'll they'll just walk out. Yeah, you know the, the, mo the moment literally the moment you quote Thomas Aquinas, you've lost. Even That's I just... would walk out. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You know, no, no, and, and and you're not even joking. So so you have you have to find some you have, you have to find some other way of getting there. Yeah. Otherwise, people people are just going to tune out. Um, so I thought, well, you know, is this is this a worthwhile project? And I've I've actually come to think, no, no, this is a stupid waste of my time. Because actually, I, I shouldn't. I, I shouldn't need to make the case for human nature. Because all you have to do is open your eyes. And actually, the more interesting question is: What does it mean to open your eyes? What does it mean to be looking such that you can see it? And I've. I've and the more I've, the more I've thought about this, the more I've thought that actually the, the the important thing that we need to be leaning into is not trying to make an intellectual case for something which is, is just right there under our noses. It's making making a an experiential case, perhaps even, uh, a, for, for seeing the world through the lens of pattern recognition rather than through the lens of analytic, dis dissecting analysis. Um, because it's not possible to see human nature through in an analytic frame. Because if you're chopping things into ever smaller pieces and trying to fix things into ever neater boxes, you can't see something which is only perceptible through time. And you can't see something which is perceptible as an as an integrated organism within a system, and in a, in relational terms. Well, you I mean you're making some assumptions there, which I agree with, but you can understand how some people simply don't think of it that way. Now, if you think of a human being as something, you know, a, a walking poem uh, created in the image of God, something eternal, or so, however you do it, that's different than saying you're just an aggregate of chemicals and, uh, you know, you come and go and that there's nothing transcendent uh, or fixed or pointing uh, beyond ourselves. And there are many people who have that materialist view. It's, it's a little bit bleak, but that those people, uh, they, they don't, I, I, in other words, why would they want to think holistically? Why would they want to think uh, in the way that you've described? Well, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to persuade those people to think holistically. That's, that's, Chances are that's just not going to happen. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll go down that road and it will end in ecocide. And then who, whatever, whatever human civilization comes out the other side of that um, won't think like that anymore. Because by definition, it will have had to not think like that in order to survive. So, I mean, it's not a very, it's not a very upbeat. You know, in not the long term, in the long no, term, it's, it's not upbeat. even slightly upbeat. No, no, no. no but, but, but I mean, no, you, you, I know, you've got I to know. take the long view. You've got yeah. to take the long view. If you take the long view, it's upbeat. In every other, in every other respect, it's deeply mm -hmm. doomerish. I accept that. But. We do have to get to the Ponzi scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. So, so within within the the technological order, the, the within the cyborg order, um, 
in which we find ourselves now. In which we find ourselves now. Um, there are, I mean, the the incredible thing, the, the incredible thing again about human nature is that notwithstanding the all the pressures on women to think of ourselves as fungible work units, to think of ourselves as no, in, in, indistinguishable from men, you know, as just disembodied consciousnesses piloting a meat suit and driving a spreadsheet <laughs> and whatever. Um, it, regard, despite all of those pressures, there are still a great, you know, the, the majority of women, more more women than not, still want kids. You know, if that doesn't speak to the reality and the enduring power of our nature, I don't know what does. So, so here we are, and you know, this uh, uh, more more women than not still want kids. I mean, you know, let, let's not get into birth rates because that's a whole whole other can of worms. But you know, lots of lots of women are still having kids, and yet we this is this is not a this is not a world which is very welcoming to mothers with dependent infants. I mean, anecdotally, I've got a friend who works in perinatal mental mental health support, and she tells me that without fail, it's the mothers who believe that nothing will change for them after they have a baby who are the most likely to experience postpartum depression. Without fail, because they're not they're not prepared for how much it does change you, and they're not prepared for how utterly it pulls apart the the liberal relation you have to reality. This idea that you can be a free, I mean, that it's good to be free and unencumbered and an atomized subject. And the experience of caring for a child and the experience of being needed so fundamentally by something so dependent and whom you would give your life for in, in, in almost all cases is so radically at odds with that paradigm that it just, it just melts your brain. And, and those women who are least prepared for it are the ones who, who struggle the hardest. Mm. This, is just, this is just consistently the case. Um, so, so here we, so here we, here you are. You know, you've, you've, despite, despite all of the transhumanist urges to become a, a the homunculus piloting a meat suit. Here you are with this dependent <laughs> infant, and you've got to try and, you've got to try and square that circle. And, and a lot of women square that circle by saying, well, or, you know, either through economic pressure or through, through whatever, whatever other thought processes they go through, saying, fine, well, you know, I've got to go back to work. You know, either because they want to, because they love their job, or because they have to, because otherwise the house is going to get repossessed one way or another. Um, you know, most women end up. At which point somebody's still got to look after the baby because the nature of a baby has not changed any more than our nature as women has changed. You know, you can't just leave, can't just leave an eight month old baby to fend for itself in the house all day. You know, somebody's got to look after it. Who's that going to be? Inevitably, it ends up being other women. Um, so, so what you end up with in practice in order to emancipate women from the, 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 the basic givens of motherhood and the basic, you know, the, the, ex, the, the needs of a dependent child are that you, you simply outsource the caring, the, the, your, the, the caring aspect of the work that you're doing to somebody else. To another um, woman. To another woman. Always. Um, and, and, it's, and it is almost without, almost without fail another woman. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, and so, and, and it's usually, you know, but more often than not, you know, it'll be, it'll be someone poor or it'll be you yeah. know, a racial minority or it'll be, you know, some other, some other woman who's in a less fortunate, and then she's, she's got to figure out what to do with her kid. <laughs> so has so, anyone besides you ever pointed this out? Because when I read this... Actually, yes. There's a, a Nancy Fraser, who is a, a very much more left-wing uh, thinker than I am. She wrote, a, she, and, she and two others whose names escape me right now wrote a book called Feminism for the 99%. Which is so the 19 feminism, and she she points out that the Sheryl Sandbergs of this world are able to lean in because, and actually, what they're doing is leaning on all of those other women, all the way down right. the Ponzi scheme, who are doing the work. Right. And, so and it's women taking advantage of other women without saying so or pretending not to be doing that. No. I mean, I, to be clear, to be clear, I'm I'm not going to I'm I'm not going to throw brickbats at any any woman for the choices that she has to make, um, because nine times out of ten, you, you'll you'll find that women are acutely ambivalent about about the about the choice. You know, most most mothers with little babies in childcare feel very conflicted about it, um, and and it's very it's very difficult to to, to figure out what to do with the, in the world as it is without feeling as though somebody is pointing a finger at you and saying you're doing it wrong. Mm. And I, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be one of those yeah, women who's yeah. saying, hey, you, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Because I mean, if you, if you stay home with your kids, somebody's going to point the finger at you and yeah. say, you know, you're, you're letting the side down or you're, you're just lazing around or yeah. you're, you're just wrong in some other way. Yeah. You know, a, a woman's place is not in the home. A woman's place is in the wrong. 
<laughs> and and I, you know, I, I don't want to join that chorus, but but I think there there well, are structural. Well, you're doing the opposite of joining that. that chorus. I think you're giving uh, hope uh, to the women who find themselves maybe wanting to stay home. You're you're you are saying to them, yes, that's not a it's not a crazy idea. I don't think it is a crazy idea. And I, but but I, but what I what I should also say to that is that it's it's a luxury now to be able to stay home. You know the world the world as it is now mm. uh, makes stay at home mums a luxury good. Um, it, it perhaps wasn't the case when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean my, I had a fairly average middle class upbringing, and we were able to we were able to raise a family on one income. That's almost almost never the case now, unless you're incredibly well off. Um, and, the, and so the reality is, for most families, that both parents have to work to some degree or another. And in that context, I'm, again, I'm very hesitant to to point the finger yeah. at to point the finger at mothers and say you're doing it wrong. Right. Um, but uh, but what I any time any time a woman in the, in her early twenties asks me, you know, how do you think I should how do you think I should plan ahead because I really want to be a mum? Yeah. I say, well, okay, so you should probably be looking for for a line of work professionally which is maximally portable and is and and which you can do at least to some extent from home. You know, don't look for a job which keeps you lo for long hours out necessarily yeah. out of out yeah. of out of the home. Look for something you can do from home. Um, look for something you can do flexibly. That you can scale up or scale down depending on the needs of your family. And that way, chances are you'll be able to exist in public. You'll be able to you'll be able to contribute to the household expenses, and you also won't miss your children growing up. So you know, those are some. <laughs> I mean, this is the the woman I know who's maximally nailed work life balance is actually my hairdresser. <laughs> she she works out of her garage. She's got yeah. a perfect, perfectly sized miniature studio in yeah, her garage. Yeah. Um, you know, and even even with like the little Biscoff biscuits and the and the, and the cappuccino machine, it's, it's just perfect. Um, and she's and, and she's a great hairdresser, and, and it's all there. Um, and she she works around. She works. She has she has two lovely daughters. She works around school hours. Her mum lives nearby. Um, her husband also works from home. Um, she's nailed it. Um, she's she she's she she contributes to the household. You know yeah. they're 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 both equal the e economically they're both active. But what they've done in an in a very twenty first century way is recreate the productive household from before the industrial era. That's actually That's, and, and that yeah. that I think is absolutely crucial. And you know of course there are going to be there are some lines of work where you can't do yeah. that. But anytime anyone asks me, I say that that's that's the holy grail. Yeah. If you can recreate the productive household, as where both parents are doing some kind of work in conjunction with child caring in a way which allows at least a bit of flexibility, yeah. um, then you you have a you have a shot at a family life as well as being as well as kids. We um, we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to touch a little bit more on transhumanism, or maybe you can just say some things about AI. We were talking earlier, and you had some thoughts, but it's a, I'll leave it up to you. Oh, I don't know. I you know there are, you you get lots of hype in the press about how you know we're going to end up with some kind of super intelligent computer. I, I, I have to say, and... just bluntly, I think AI is mostly nonsense. In other words, this idea that you know, first of all, it's artificial intelligence, which is to say, it's artificial. It's just computing on another level, right? Uh, and human beings, it's you know, it's a very fancy autocorrect. Well, it's right. a very, you've said that before, and I'm glad you said it now. It's a very fancy autocorrect. That's all it is. It's a technology. It's right. it's not we're not we're not creating machines that can evolve consciousness. But people act as though because they don't believe in human nature, um, they seem to think that anything can happen, and machines can get so smart that they can have consciousness and supplant us which is a little silly no no that, that's just silly uh, which is not which is not to say it won't have transformative effects indeed it is already having transformative yeah. effects i mean there are there are some corners of for, for example in business business research in you know in business sector research where people who are adept with it, data scientists who are good with ai can do can do in days what uh, what a what, what a researcher might previously have taken weeks to do, because they they just know how to how to get the AI to do the do the basic work for them. Mm -hmm. But then what what you then need is the human input at the end to do the sense checking, um, and I think I think that that's a that that serves as a template for both where the threat lies with AI, um, which is not which is to say it's not going to turn us all into paper clips and, and take over the world. But what it will do is displace a lot of living living breathing human beings with families who depend on them. From lines of work that they've been they've been engaged in possibly for decades, and at a point where they where they may or may not be able to reskill, 
um, because it just it's just able to do do certain certain very limited types of pattern recognition quicker mm. and more effectively than a human could. So 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 there there is a real threat there. Um, you know, much the same way as automated checkout machines replace cashiers up to a point, but then there's, you still need. But then um, what what, do you, what and so then what you what you get instead of instead of the people doing either the you know putting packets through a scanner or you know counting counting ships or whatever whatever you happen to be doing <laughs> you you end you you end up with with people whose job it is to debug so you you've got the sense checker at the end who's going through the report and 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 saying well does this actually make sense does this stack up you know i need to check the database and make sure the robot hasn't done something idiotic and you know in the, in the same way in the supermarket is you you've got you've got the one person who's replaced 10 cashiers whose job it is to, to to press the button when invariably the machine says unexpected item in bagging area or some other stupid thing that drives driving everybody crazy so so it, the, there are so so the, the the human input is maybe reduced yeah. but it's not non-existent and mm -hmm. it's new kinds of input which is a in 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 the in the form of sense checking and debugging um, and i think the you, this is this is something which i've I've reflected on as a writer a great deal because there's a lot of there's a lot of kinds of writing which are rendered obsolete by AI. You know the the kind of the kind of tedious commercial copywriting grunt work which I was rubbish at for years and years and years um, is is increasingly obsolete because you really can just get robots to do it. And, <laughs> and it, you know, let's face it, a lot of it will probably be better for that, <laughs> or at least it's not going to be any worse. Mm -hmm. But there are also there are also kinds kinds of writing and kinds of yeah there there, 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 there there's kinds of reading and writing that the robot self evidently can't do because they're just going to regurgitate garbage and that's that's very much more like a kind of sense checking and and a kind of sense making um, and one of the one of the phenomena really I think you know what what figures such as you Eric do um, is is to aggregate streams of information and the thoughts and reflections and commentaries mm -hmm. that go on that to try and make sense of this very bewildering world that we live in now and to distill that into 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 a form which is which is then welcomed by an audience of people who will who'll say well thank god somebody's done that for me because i don't have time to do this myself and yet i need to i need to understand this so then maybe i will continue to have a job i mean i don't think eric come on come in conclusion on. in yes. conclusion the, I, no 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 the robot is not going to put you out of business eric i think you knew that i think but, i did know, i think <laughs> i did i think i did well i'm afraid we're out of time uh join me in thanking mary harrington